Hello. We will be covering chapter four this week, the last chapter from unit one, and it is called Society and Social Interaction. In this chapter, we'll go through a little bit of a brief um, introduction, and then we're going to get more into detail on those three founding fathers of sociology from chapter one, being Emil Durkheim, Karl Marx, and Max Weber. And then after that, we'll do a little review of different symbolic interactionist sociologists. So let's start with um, a definition. Always a good place to start. So society is a group of people who live in a definable community and share the same culture. So we're going to start with Gerard Lenski. He was a sociologist who came up with this concept of sociocultural evolution. So he defines societies according to how much technology they used and how developed their technology was or is. So the more complex the technology, the more advanced is the civilization to Lenski. This is what we'll call an evolutionary classification of societies because, of course, as your technology evolves, Lenski views the society overall as more greatly evolved. But of course, kind of the other side of that coin is that um, societies that didn't have highly developed technology um, are viewed as you know, unevolved um, societies which some critics have a problem with. We'll come back to um, more on that in chapter 10. But for now, let's go forward with Lenski's evolutionary classification. So he classifies societies according to whether they're pre-industrial, industrial, or post-industrial. There is um, a little video on this slide if you'd like to watch it. Um, over here, right here, and then I'll just give you a nice little crash course um, and introduce you to a lot of the concepts that we are going to cover here. It also goes a little bit back to um, some of what we covered in chapter one, just to give you a little refresh. Lenski's um, less evolved societies are your pre-industrial societies. So we'll take a little occupations here because the economy is not that well developed. Um, economic production is limited to what the human themselves with fairly, um, fairly undeveloped tools. So within the pre-industrial societies there's kind of four subcategories that we move through. So we start with hunter-gatherer societies about 10 to 12,000 years ago. These are your nomadic tribes, your kinship groups, your foragers, and your hunters. Then society evolves into the pastoral and horticultural 7,500 years ago. This is where we start seeing domestication of animals, cultivation of plants. More specialized occupations begin to develop because there's a surplus of goods and um, people start to settle in one place rather than uh, nomadically traveling hither and thither. Local trading starts to develop because with permanent settlements, um, people can actually trade among different little townships. And because of that, there's more stability and more material goods. Then about 5,000 years ago, societies evolved again into 
um, the Agricultural Society. This is when a lot of focus started going into our agriculture. We started developing crop rotation, um, using fertilizer, developing better tools for farming. And this led to uh, more stable harvests and food surpluses. So with a more stable food supply, you can develop many other aspects of society. Um, we moved from permanent settlements to actually developing established towns and cities. Of course, with the development of towns and cities, we start to see people start to define themselves a little bit more clearly and usually in contrast to other people. And so we see social classes start to emerge and become more divisive. At the same time, if there are sur food surpluses and food security, people don't have to be so concerned on a day-to-day -day basis on just surviving, being able to live and eat. So once you have a um, secure food system, you can actually have time to develop the arts in your society, like music and poetry and philosophy. Then around 800 AD or AC, um, the feudal society comes about and evolves out of the agricultural society. And the feudal society, you have a lot more strict hierarchical um, power structures being developed here. A lot of it is based around land ownership and protection. So if you recall back to your history classes from high school, probably talked about the vassals and the lordships and how the lords technically owned the land, but they let the vassals and the peasants live there as long as they maybe gave them a percentage of their crop yields or brought him one sheep a month. Um, and in exchange for doing that, the Lord would let them live on his property and also would pr um, protect them in case anyone else ever came to kind of attack their land. Now, um, industrial society kind of evolved from feudal society. So the Industrial Revolution took place around 1760 to 1840. During this time, huge surge in technological innovation, creation of the steam engine, textile mills start to rise up, mechanical cedars are developed for farming, and this led to even greater food security and soaring agricultural productivity. Healthcare and education started to be more widely developed and accessible. There's a rise of urban centers, so development of cities and large buildings um, and increased diversity within the cities. Yeah, but the factory system, of course, and an explosion in production of material goods. So obviously with machinery, you can produce a lot more than you can with just a hammer. Um, so we started to see a big surplus of goods and a little bit of a, a rise in the standard of living for a lot of people. Though there were still a lot of a lot of issues like pollution and child labor, of course. And within industrial society, we see the burgeoning of the capitalist economy and system, and along with it, the social mobility that that brings. So people, unlike in feudalism, where you're Kind of stuck in your position your whole life. I was born a peasant, I'll be a peasant and live on this lord's land forever. An industrial society with capitalism also becomes this um, opportunity for people to improve their economic situation. Now moving from industrial to post-industrial society, is where we are now um, during our day and age. Um, the post-industrial society is also known as an information society or a digital society. Um, 
This society is based on production of information and services rather than um, production of goods in a factory. The post-industrial society is driven by knowledge and information. Power lies with those in charge of storing and distributing information. Social class is divided by access to education. More people are employed as sellers of services in a post-industrial society than as a producer of goods. And if you look over at the um, graph here on the slide, you'll see oh, a little messy there. You'll see um, the major sectors of the U.S. economy and how they've changed from 1900 to 1950 to the year 2000. So you can see yellow is agriculture. So in 1900, 38% of the U.S. economy was devoted to agriculture. Flash forward to 1950, 12% of the U.S. economy was based on agriculture. And then you move over to 2000 and you see that little teeny tiny yellow um, area where 2% uh, of our economy is represented by agricultural production. Now, the other side of that coin can look at services in blue. So in 1900, service sector was about a little more than a quarter of the U.S. economy. In 1950, the service sector almost well, kind of doubled a little under 50% of our economy. And in 2000, almost three-fourths of the U.S. economy is based on the service sector. And then manufacturing, of course, in um, green here. If we go back to 1900, manufacturing was 36% in 1900. Grew a little bit in 1950 um, to 41% of the economy and go forward to 2000, manufacturing down to one quarter of the U.S. economy. So in post-industrial societies, a lot of us um, work in service positions. Now we're gonna turn to the real meat and potatoes of this chapter which is to take a little bit of a deeper look into our three founding fathers of sociology. And these are Emile Durkheim, Marx, and Max Weber. They're the three most prominent modern sociologists. You can go pick up an intro to sociology textbook on any campus across the country, and I promise you they will list these three men as your uh, quote-unquote founding fathers of sociology. So it's important to definitely your lecture and really delve into each one of their um, perspectives and different um, theories that they've proposed. Now, we'll start with Emile Durkheim. He is known for being a structural functionalist. He is a positivist. So if we think back to what we've learned so far in the class, um, positivism, again, he's aiming to create this kind of science of social facts and positivism opposed to constructivism is very much focused on kind of trying to glean some sort of objective information about society, something that can be measured and even put into a mathematic formula or um, something that can be measured and we can determine statistics um, and what those statistics mean for society and um, kind of go from there with the formula. So science, um, the science of social facts is based in positivism, and we'll get into uh, kind of how he operationalized that in the next few slides. 
there is a introductory video on this slide if you'd like to watch it linked to here and you'll just go um, over the basics of Emile Durkheim but these videos have a little bit more production value than uh, I have at this point so they might be a little more fun um, fun little recap videos maybe for you to watch over before the unit one exam or to go back and refresh before the final exam So here's a little um, recap on Durkheim from chapter one. So he's a scientist and an academic, and his aim was to create a science of social facts. So sociology kind of came about after um, a lot of other sciences had established themselves and become, you know, quote unquote, respectable in the academic field. So sociology arose and as with any new field in education, it kind of it has to it has to prove itself. And Durkheim felt that the best way to prove sociology as a valuable science was to kind of model sociology and sociological research on the other established sciences of the time, like geology or biology or psychology. So he wanted to create a science, and so you'll notice a lot of terms in Durkheim where you can tell that he is um, really trying to lay out uh, this science of social facts and um, objective social facts that can be measured, and we can come to some sort of objective, um, clear, unarguable conclusion about society based on this kind of research. So objective social facts are the ideas and worldview of individuals. This is what he called the collective conscience, and it's derived from the social order. So Durkheim felt that every society has something called the collective conscience. It's kind of this thing that almost like an invisible um, weight that weighs on all of us as individuals in the society and that we cannot escape. There's certain things, beliefs, norms in every society that no individual can really counter. And he called this the collective conscious. He also had a term, social facts. So social facts are kind of what make up the collective conscious. Social facts are laws, morals, values, religious beliefs, customs, holidays, rituals, fashion, all of these things that serve to govern our lives with each other on a daily basis. And all those social facts combined create the collective conscious. Durkheim was also very concerned with um, conflict and chaos in society. Again, he's a structural functionalist, so he's interested in how we can structure society in order to function more perfectly. So if he sees any kind of um, kind of dysfunction in society, in conflict or chaos or protest, um, to use a timely example, he would look at this problem as something that must be solved. And um, he would say that it was the failure of social institutions to indoctrinate citizens with that collective conscience, those collective norms and values that society needs to share in order to survive. Now we're going to look at a few more Durkheimian terms here. So some of the most important things to Durkheim that all kind of serve to make up this collective conscience are norms and values, institutions, symbols and rituals, and the division of labor. Um, so we'll go a little bit more into symbols and rituals, in particular in the U.S. that 
um, kind of help define our collective conscience. So in the U.S., some symbols, um, the American flag, the Constitution, the Christmas tree, Mount Rushmore, the bald eagle, all these things kind of symbolize our, our oneness, the society that we are a part of. And just seeing them can remind us um, of the society and what's important to us. Then there's rituals like pledging allegiance to the flag, celebrating 4th of July or Memorial Day, um, standing up and singing the Star Spangled Banner. These are all rituals that we take place, um, take part in, and give us a sense of togetherness and kind of set apart certain days or performances apart from kind of our mundane ritual, um, day-to-day lives, and instead gives us um, a moment or a day to reflect on kind of larger social cohesiveness, things that bring us together. The Durkheim also was very um, interested in the division of labor and how the division of labor kind of integrates the society. So he felt that different people performing different tasks within society or different jobs, it maintains the material survival of all the people in that society. Interdependence is the key word here. So the division of labor kind of promotes this interdependence between people and that interdependence sustains the social order. So as we'll see in the slides to come, this is um, in opposition to Karl Marx, who viewed the division of labor as kind of separating classes and creating class conflict. So Durkheim disagrees with Marx here, um, or rather Marx disagreed with Durkheim. Um, as Durkheim sees the division of labor, different people making different, amount, different amounts of money, he viewed this as fundamentally integrating society and not causing division. So a few more terms on Durkheim here. Modernization um, and deviance in particular. So as we'll see with uh, Marx, Weber, and Durkheim, they all kind of viewed modernization and the modern social era as um, kind of tearing apart society in many different ways. So for Durkheim, he felt that modernization was eating away at these social norms that people hold in common. It was creating fragmentation and individuation people not viewing themselves as like one big society anymore, but as individuals. And obviously when we're talking about Durkheim, when people become more and more individualized and separated from one another, um, obviously that social conscience is going to get, um, the collective conscience is going to get less and less strong. And thus will bring about more kind of chaos and conflict. He was also interested in deviance. Um, deviance, we'll come back to a whole chapter on deviance in a few weeks, but for now, deviance is anything that really kind of goes against the social norms of acceptability. So Durkheim viewed um, another kind of tragic offshoot of modernization was deviance. Um, and again, this is because the collective conscious exerts less of an influence over people. And so they don't see themselves as tied kind of to these social norms and morals anymore. And so more crime, theft, and other instances of deviance start to kind of explode with modernization. Now Durkheim, he wrote a book called Suicide in 1897. What he was interested in arguing here was against kind of the psychologist um, viewpoint of suicide or the biologist viewpoint of suicide. He said, 
that psychologists were a bit too limited in their focus in trying to explain why people choose to end their own lives. Um, psychologists, you know, will usually uh, talk to or analyze the individual when it comes to these kinds of matters. Um, maybe look at the individual's brain function or look at the individual's family history, what kind of parents they had, if they had a happy or a sad childhood, um, so on and so forth. So they're looking at the individual. But Durkheim said, no, suicide is not just about the individual, it's about society. So in order to prove that, he went around and looked at various different countries and the different suicide rates that all the different countries had. What he found comparing different country suicide rates was that they were very different from each other. And the statement Durkheim made was, well, if, if everything boils down to just the individual and suicide is not an act um, that is based on society at all, then why would you have these very different rates in different countries? He said it's something social, explains this kind of discrepancy in suicide rates between different countries. Um, so he eventually concluded that due to insufficient inculcation of social norms and inadequate integration into society, this is where suicides start to become more and more prevalent and rampant. So once the social um, facts and the collective conscience are weak, then you'll have more um, individuals in society who might not you know, maybe not see that bigger purpose for their lives, maybe not see themselves connected to anyone else. And so he viewed it, yes, as an individual problem, but also a major social problem as well. Now again, Emil Durkheim is a structural functionalist. So this means that society to him is greater than just the sum of its parts. Uh, if you remember from chapter one, there's a little um, graphic of the body and all the organs. So Durkheim is saying, we don't just look at one organ, we look at how all the different organs work together in order to um, keep the body running. And society is the same exact thing. You can't just look at one social fact. You have to look at all the social facts. And the combination of those are the collective conscious. And the collective conscious is what keeps a society functioning. So here, similar to what we were talking about on the last slide for Durkheim, individual behavior is not the same as studying collective social behavior and vice versa. So he was interested in what made individuals in the society act in similar and predictable ways. Again, a little recap on the collective conscious. These are the communal beliefs, morals, and attitudes of a society. And social integration with the collective conscious is a key factor in social life. Now, some of Durkheim's terms to keep in mind um, for the video on this page and also for your exams are social facts. Again, those laws, morals, values, religious beliefs, customs, fashion, rituals that govern social life. Um, and these social facts create social solidarity. So social solidarity is pretty much just means we're in this together. So the more that people kind of abide by the same laws, morals, values, religious beliefs, um, the more kind of cohesive that society will be. And again, Durkheim believed that chaos and conflict is due to 
um, the failure of social institutions to indoctrinate citizens with the proper collective conscious or values and norms. So let's just read over these little quotes from Dirt Pime on the left here. Um, for this one to the left, it is society which, fashioning us in its image, fills us with religious, political, and moral beliefs that control our actions. And then the next one, society is not a mere sum of individuals. Rather, the system formed by their association represents a specific reality which has its own characteristics. Now, there's a little movie linked to in the upper right here. Um, it's about, I think it's 15 to 20 minutes, and it's an old short story. I believe it was written in the 1950s, and then they made a, a short movie out of the story in 1969, and it is called The Lottery. If you like, uh, like Twilight Zone type shows or Black Mirror, you might really enjoy watching this. Um, though it's in black and white, a little old funny. But if you want this um, little short thriller, you will notice a lot of you know, kind of Durkheimian kind of philosophy in this film. Now for Durkheim, again, he's a structural functionalist, and he believes that as the collective conscious becomes weaker, society enters a state of chaos and normlessness, which Durkheim calls anime. So anime is a personal state of isolation and anxiety resulting from a lack of social control and regulation. So Durkheim was motivated by the concern that the social glue of modern age societies was weakening. He argued that with modernity and modernization, individuals were more and more distanced from each other. Division of labor, increasing levels of complexity and specialization brought about a situation where everyone's not doing the same things anymore. People are not immediately dependent on each other. So society no longer requires assimilation to a, a common set of values, and different value systems begin to coexist. Um, but to Durkheim, obviously, as much um, as it is, he felt that different value systems could not coexist in a society, as you, know, you need that strong collective conscious in order for a society to function well. So because of all this, Durkheim was concerned with what could be done to avoid a state of chaos or normlessness in modern society, which he called anime. Now we'll see um, with Marx and Weber as well, they have similar um, ideas about the state of society and modernization, but they will have different um, terms to describe it. So Durkheim refers to the state of chaos or normlessness as anime, and then we'll see um, in the slides to come what Marx and Weber have to say. So we'll start on Karl Marx here, who is a conflict theorist. He um, as we'll see in the next few slides, his conflict is it's based mostly on class conflict, so conflict between different economic classes. And there's a couple quotes on this slide from Marx. Um, first, the, hither, or, <laughs> the history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. And the one on the right, if money is the bond binding me to human life, binding society to me, connecting me with nature and man, is not money the bond of all bonds. And Karl Marx is a conflict theorist, so he believed that social conflict between different groups of people is how you change society. 
He believed that history of social progress is defined by class struggle. So um, he defined uh, that struggle between different social classes in the modern era as the one between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. The bourgeoisie represents the ruling class, the rich people, the owners of factories, the owners of land um, that they then rent out to the working class, also known as the proletariat. So the proletariat are the ones going to work, clocking in, working 12 hour day in the factory, um, getting paid maybe 25 cents a day, um, and then going home to their rented apartments or townhomes and waking up and going back to work for the ruling class again. Um, but why does the proletariat do that? Because the bourgeoisie or the ruling class owns all of the means of production. So your means of production are your tools, factories, infrastructure like railroads, the internet, natural resources, raw materials, any tool, resource, or machine that's needed in order to produce in modern times. Um, so we have the bourgeoisie and the proletariat in modernity in this constant class struggle with each other because they have different interests. Um, the private property versus the wage labor. And here there's a quote from Marx that says, labor does not appear as an end in itself, but as the servant of the wage. So we'll see in the slides to come that Marx felt that Humans being able to produce and create and make things is a huge part of kind of our, what he calls our species essence. And he felt that kind of capitalism and the economy and this division between the owners and the workers was creating the situation where people went to work, clocked in, clocked out. They didn't really have anything to show for it when they left because everything they made that day um, still belonged to the owner of the factory, the owner of the means of production, and they didn't even um, have the ability to sell it themselves or see who it was sold to. Everything was kind of uh, taken away from the worker, as Marx sees it. And because of that, Marx um, talks about alienation and the division of labor. Again, think back to Durkheim that we just talked about. Durkheim felt that the division of labor was great. It integrated society, um, but modernization brought about a state of anime and normlessness. But now when we talk about Karl Marx, he views the division of labor as estranging people, separating people from each other and from production. Um, we start to view our work and other people as a means to an end and not as ends in themselves. And he felt kind of the ultimate um, result of this would be the state of alienation. More on this in a few slides. For Marx, everything boils down to the economy and money and economic classes in conflict. So he has these two terms, the base and the superstructure, that arise a lot in his readings. Um, so the base is anything that having to do with the economic system, the means of production, the economic classes, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, the technology, the money, the commodities, everything that makes up kind of that capitalist market, um, the products, the means of production, and the kind of relations of production being those different economic classes. And then everything else in our social life, according to Marx, arises in the interest of the economic base. So he interprets our religion, our philosophy, our media, educational and political institutions, 
all of these aspects of our social life are merely embodiments of the ruling ideas of the ruling class. So the kind of messages that we're getting from all of these different social arenas like politics and religion and media, education, these are things that represent the superstructure and actually serve the interests of the capitalist system. They kind of teach us the right way to act as um, proletariat, so to speak. So in other words, Marx believes that the films and TV shows we watch, the art we look at, the religion we follow, the schools we go to, the political system we put faith in, these are all simply quote unquote tools to control and distract the people created and maintained by the upper class, the bourgeoisie. They are not independent of the economic system or the base. So just to reiterate Marx and conflict theory, um, the economic system determines all social life, government, family structure, religion, education, and culture. And Marx saw conflict in society between the owners of the means of production and the laborers as the primary means of historical change. So with the advent of industrial society modernization, there became two classes in opposition to one another, the bourgeoisie, the industrial employees, the landowners, and the proletariat, the workers. He was critical of the exploitative conditions of industrial factory labor at the time, um, criticizing the long hours, the use of child labor, and the filthy and toxic conditions in the factories and in the cities. Marx, what we do is who we are. So the labor that we perform is critical for our identity and our humanity. He compares kind of modern factory labor to previous forms of work and labor, like in agricultural or feudal societies. And he says that there was still a connection between the worker and the product of their labor in these societies. But he said that with the birth of capitalism and the industrial society, the quote unquote revolution of the bourgeoisie, um, in which the worker works for wages alone in modern society. So there's a loss of connectivity between the worker and his or her work. So for example, um, back in the feudal societies, let's say there was a master craftsman and he made watches and he spent a month making each watch, handcrafting it, carving it, um, really took the time and care and took pride in his labor. And once he finished, he would go out and sell it maybe to someone he knew or a local trader that come, would come to their village. So he knew where the product went and he was able to take pride in selling that finished work of craftsmanship to the buyer. But with the revolution of the bourgeoisie and capitalism, industry, modernization, we can't wait a month for watches anymore. Um, because each product that we make is, it makes money. And capitalists, you know, they want to continuously uh, make more money, increase their revenues, and become more successful. And so waiting on a craftsman for a month to make a watch just doesn't really make a lot of sense for um, capitalism. So instead of that way of working, they introduced kind of the factory system where several, if not um, 10, 20, 50 people might take part in putting together a watch. And all those different tasks of putting together the watch can be mechanized and broken down so that each worker maybe just does one thing. Um, the watch goes down a factory line and one worker um, puts on the hour hand, keeps going down the line, the next worker puts on the second hand, um, and so forth. And this makes the 
uh, act of production much quicker, but it kind of takes the act of production away from the worker in another sense, because they're more doing um, something that's more repetitive and mechanical rather than putting together a finished product that they can take pride in. Some Marx believe that capitalism and this way of kind of producing led to a state of alienation in modern society, meaning that individuals no longer have control over their own lives and um, their own production. So he listed out four different types of alienation that capitalism and modern times brings about. So first off, should be familiar by now, the alienation of the worker from their product. There's no control over the design or development of products. The worker just comes to work. The owner um, maybe gives them a blueprint or um, trains them so that they do the work exactly how the owner wants them to. The second type of alienation is the alienation of the worker from the act of production. So again, a lot of tasks are broken down in the division of labor within the factory, and a lot of workers are doing repetitive mechanical work. Maybe just doing one thing the entire day, every day, for years. So again, think of like the Fordist um, automobile factory line. Um, that came about not too long ago, um, which kind of revolutionized production of automobiles because, again, everything was really broken down. Every individual worker was doing something very repetitive. Um, maybe one worker uh, screwed the steering wheel into each car that comes down the line, and then the next person um, installs you know, the air conditioner, and so on and so forth. So everyone just does one thing rather than um, one person putting together a final product that they can take pride in and see the end result. So the third type of alienation is that of the worker from their species essence. So this one gets a little more philosophical, but basically, He's saying that when a worker wakes up, walks to work in the rain, in the snow, in the mud, gets to work, especially at the time Marx was writing, a lot of these factory workers were working 12, 14, 15 hour days. Um, then you clock out, you trudge home to your probably rented, dilapidated housing, and eat your dinner, go to bed, and get up and do it again tomorrow. Some works felt in this kind of economic structure, production, um, there's no room for creativity, self-development, self-expression, because workers are kind of forced to continuously sell themselves in the labor market in order to survive. And the last alienation is that of the worker from other workers. So again, in the labor market, under capitalism, workers essentially compete against each other for um, jobs, raises, better hours, and shifts. So they start to view each other not as um, a community of workers, but as workers in competition with one another um, in the capitalist system. So one major criticism of Marx is, if capitalism is so bad, why doesn't the proletariat, the working class, rise up and bring about that communist revolution that Marx predicted? Um, so Marx's answer to this is false consciousness. So Marx claimed that people in modern society were under a veil of false consciousness. And this means when the beliefs and ideals of a person are not actually in their own best interest. So Marx believed that the ruling class kind of imposed their ideology on the working class. And if you think back to that base and superstructure slide, this should make a little more sense to you. Obviously, if 
your superstructure, your media, religion, politics, all of that um, serves the bourgeoisie um, economic system, then Marx, um, Marx is basically arguing that all of those superstructural elements kind of pave the path for this veil of false consciousness. Um, some works proposed that false consciousness that had to be replaced with class consciousness, wherein the working class would become aware of their subordinate rank in society and advocate for social improvements. Marx also argued that capitalists would continue to utilize technological innovations in order to make human labor less and less necessary and valuable. So he thought that this strategy would only put off the, quote, workers revolution for a little while until the point when wages fell to an unacceptable level and jobs were disappearing due to their replacement by machines. Now we'll take a look at our third father of sociology, uh, Max Weber. So he's also a conflict theorist, but he goes a little bit beyond Marx and doesn't think that um, all social conflict is based on economic class, but things like status and political parties also played a role in social conflict in society. Um, so Max Weber was from Germany, which is why I pronounce the W in his name as a V, in case you're wondering why I'm saying it like that. <laughs> um, so here's some quotes from Weber on the right here. Uh, the first one up top, power is the chance to impose your will within a social context, even when opposed and regardless of the integrity of that chance. Second one, a government is an institution that holds a monopoly on the legitimate use of violence. And the third one, the fate of our times is characterized by rationalization and intellectualization, and above all, by the disenchantment of the world. So we'll get a little bit more into the meaning of these quotes in the next few slides. Max Weber was an anti-positivist, which we can also refer to as a constructivist. So again, positivism, Durkheim was a positivist. He was looking for complete objectivity, was trying to model his research on other sciences that were more um, developed and accepted. And Durkheim was looking for hypotheses or um, variables, independent variables, dependent variables, statistics, numbers, um, things that are objective knowledge. But Weber said that complete objectivity is impossible when it comes to social research. It doesn't all come down to numbers, according to Weber. So instead, social researchers should strive for subjectivity as they work to represent social processes cultural norms, and societal values. So unlike Durkheim, Weber's aim is not to generalize or predict or lay out hypotheses or gather statistical data that he can analyze, but Weber wants to systematically gain an in-depth and interpretive understanding of social worlds. His term for this is, again, a German term, Verstehen, um, which basically just means the outside observers of a social world attempt to understand it from an insider's point of view. So hopefully you're thinking back to the Nasarima reading and the sociological imagination reading from C. Wright Mills right now. Um, definitely. Uh, goes along the lines with that term of Verstehen. So there's a couple quotes here on the right that I included from Weber. Um, the one up, up top is the fate of an epoch or a time period that has eaten of the tree of knowledge is that it must recognize the general views of life 
and the universe can never be the products of increasing empirical knowledge that the highest ideals which move us most forcefully are always formed only in the struggle with other ideals, which are just as sacred to others as ours are to us. And then down at the bottom, Tolstoy has given the simplest answer with the words, science is meaningless because it gives no answer to our question, the only question important for us, what shall we do and how shall we live? That science does not give an answer to this is indisputable. So Weber is definitely going beyond Durkheim. He is looking at ideals, the way that people live, trying to understand from the inside how other societies are thinking, rather than just going in as you know, a civilized researcher of so society, um, and uh, just looking at them objectively, um, not trying to understand their religion, their norms, their family unit, the way that they view their lives, their beliefs, what's in their heads and their hearts. That's what Weber's looking for. So to Weber, society is a social order maintained by shared norms and structures of legitimate authority that dominate society. The monopoly on force and protection is very important here. So whoever controls the monopoly on force, that is usually your legitimate authority. So he characterized three different types of legitimate authority that can be found traditional with your established patterns and norms. These are usually found in those pre-industrial societies. So kings and queens, chiefs of tribes, the lords of the feudal era. These are all your legitimate authority figures in pre-industrial times. Then during modern times, we have both um, charismatic and rational legal or bureaucratic leadership. So in charismatic leadership, there's a non-transferable power after the death of the leader. Usually this person is obviously charismatic. They move people with just who they are, the way they talk. They carry a certain aura about them that People in the society are just driven um, to kind of follow this person or respect them. So there are some examples of charismatic leadership. Um, Hitler being one, Martin Luther, Martin Luther King Jr., um, Castro in Cuba, Gandhi. These are all people who their power really rested in their personality. And once those people kind of passed away, that power that they held also kind of um, fades away as well. And there's not really like um, an heir to their leadership, like an heir to the throne. On the other hand, we have rational, legal, or bureaucratic legitimate authority or leadership. So with industry comes increasing complexity and bureaucracy, Weber says, is the most stable form of legitimacy. This is because if you think of our own government, we have mayors, a governor, our president, our vice president, director of um, labor, director of defense, so on and so forth. There are so many kind of impartial offices that make up a bureaucracy. So it's not about the particular people holding the office. It's about the office itself and the fact that one person, you know, ends their term in an office doesn't mean that the entire government is going to fall apart. Um, the office is still there and another person will be elected to take that office over. So it's not necessarily the person that we respect in bureaucratic um, forms of legitimacy, but we respect the office. 
So um, offices are very effective, they're impartial, and they are rules-based. So every kind of bureaucracy has its handbook um, or code book or laws that kind of guide what is and is not within that office's power. So the power is vested in the office, not the particular person. For instance, um, President Obama, when he was in the office of presidency, there were plenty of people who liked him and there were plenty of people who did not like Obama on a personal level. But the fact that he did sit in that impartial, um, rules-based office of the presidency meant that we, as a whole, as a society, at least respected the fact that he held that office. At the same time, Obama left the office and um, someone else, in this case, President Trump, took over the office and we still respect the office of presidency, no matter who sits in the position. Um, So Max Weber, like Durkheim and Marx, was also concerned about social change and modernization and all the negative effects brought about by industry and capitalism. So for Weber, again, economic class, status, and political party were all important to take into account when analyzing society. He's a conflict theorist, but unlike Marx, he felt that there was a lot more to life than just labor and capital. So he believed that conflict occurred between people on many different levels, not just economic levels. He also believed Marx was a little bit too focused on the physical world, so labor and production, and he didn't pay enough attention to ideas and the soul of a society. So Weber was very critical of rationalization in modernity. The rational society is entirely based around logic and efficiency. Um, bureaucrats act upon rationalization. Bureaucracy and rationalization are one and the same thing. So rationalization has a solitary goal of ever increasing the calculability and predictability of life by constantly improving technical efficiency and promoting a wholly instrumental and scientific worldview. So what's that mean? That means we'll see a lot of hierarchical structures in a bureaucratic um, or rational kind of organization. You'll see a very strict chain of command you'll see universal and impersonal rule. Um, so the laws that we write into our books, at least in theory, are supposed to apply to all people, even the rulers. So it's universal and impersonal. Um, bureaucracies and rationality also necessitates competent and trained officials and a specialized division of labor to efficiently carry out assigned tasks. Um, so rationalization is evident in our modern bureaucracies, but also pervades many more aspects of our social lives, the economy, the education system, suburban communities, driving on the road, online dating, factory farming, the workplace, the DMV, going to the supermarket. Bureaucracy and rationalization are rampant throughout our daily social lives in modern society. So while this leads to a lot of advantages for social life, there's a lot more um, to do, to see, to experience. There are a lot more opportunities at our fingertips. Um, it makes things more convenient. Vapor's also worried about the eventual outcome of such a rationalized world. Vapor believes that 
the overly rationalized and mechanized work environment and the increasingly uniform and sterile social world becomes dehumanizing and leads to what he calls a disenchantment of life. Again, Weber is very concerned with the soul of society. And if things become so bureaucratized or rationalized, um, he that they can kind of take away that soul of the society. So Weber thought that people are alienated from the means of administration. Remember, Marx said people were um, alienated from the means of production. So for Weber, it's the means of administration. Basically, the means to direct your own life um, and not just about how, what you produce. So he viewed rationalization as dehumanizing as there was inadequate attention to the individual and to humanity. He felt that rationalization, bureaucratization alienated people and led to kind of a loss of meaning. As the state and the rest of our society becomes more complex and centralized, the power of individuals is diminished. So values, traditions, emotions, they're displaced by formal and impersonal bureaucratic practices. Weber believed that society was losing its soul in exchange for efficiency and rationality, that all the mysticism and spirituality of human life was dying away. He was pessimistic about emancipation or revolution and saw no possible way that bureaucracies could be torn down because they were such an effective form of legitimate authority due to those impersonal offices. So he felt, unfortunately, and pessimistically, that we were all prisoners of the iron cage of modern institutions. He felt that bureaucracies were unbreakable because since they're not vested in any in particular family or person, like in previous forms of legitimate authority, um, and due to the impersonal offices and the impersonal laws that bureaucracies could theoretically just keep on going forever and that they were unbreakable. So that was a bit on those founding fathers of sociology and their theoretical perspectives. So remember Durkheim, a structural functionalist, and he is a positivist. And Marx and Weber are constructivists. They are anti-positivists. They are not looking for statistics or formulas. They're not setting forth hypotheses and kind of mirroring their work on um, other sciences. They are not using the scientific method to um, come to their conclusions. Instead, they're analyzing history, um, looking at economic patterns, talking to people, trying to understand society's religious beliefs and norms from the society's perspective, rather than trying to measure it in some sort of numerical or objective form. Um, so, so again, Durkheim, a positivist, Marx and Weber, constructivist. Durkheim is a structural functionalist. Marx is a conflict theory where the conflict is based on class. And Weber is a conflict theorist who kind of expands it a bit, looks at class, status, and political parties. But now we'll move on to kind of that third paradigm, which is symbolic interactionism. And this is more recent um, and has come about more in, in the mid 1900s to now. So the focus of symbolic interactionism is on subjectivity, interpretation, interpersonal communication, how people and social groups create meaning and view themselves. So we're going to go over a few um, 
of the main symbolic interactionists that kind of paved the way for this paradigm. So in 1966, Peter Berger and Thomas Luckman wrote The Social Construction of Reality. In it, they came up with these two terms, habitualization and institutionalization. Habitualization is society is created by humans and human interaction. Any action is, that is repeated frequently becomes cast into a pattern. In other words, we construct our society but we also accept it because others have created it before us. In short, society is a habit. Then institutionalization is the process by which those habits, those conventions or norms are implanted into a society. So institutions are products of our collective habits over time. Everyone plays a part in this. So, Unlike the theorists on the previous slides that we've been talking about, who um, talk about the collective consciousness or the bourgeois directing all of the superstructure and dictating social life, or Weber, who views anyone who has the um, rights to the legitimate authority and force, as dictating social life, social construction of reality, and symbolic interactionists give a lot more kind of power to the people. So people are the ones that are actually kind of creating our social reality. There's no kind of conspiracy uh, above us. Um, kind of dictating our social life. We create our social worlds and we create that meaning. So again, as it says on the bottom, everyone plays a part in this. This contrasts with other perspectives that view institutions like bureaucracy or the economy as obscure, nefarious entities that control our lives. And put a little, um, excerpt from this book over here to the right. We can just start um, with the second paragraph here. So to exaggerate the importance of theoretical thought in society and history is a natural failing of theorizers. It is then all the more necessary to correct this intellectualist misapprehension. The theoretical formulations of reality whether they be scientific or philosophical or even mythological, do not exhaust what is real for the members of a society. Since this is so, the sociology of knowledge must first of all concern itself with what people know as reality in their everyday non or pre-theoretical lives. In other words, common sense knowledge rather than ideas must be the central focus for the sociology of knowledge. It is precisely this knowledge that constitutes the fabric of meanings without which no society could exist. And on this slide, there are a couple more excerpts from the social construction of reality. So let's look at this one under habitualization here. Habitualized actions, of course, retain their meaningful character for the individual, although the meanings involved become embedded as routines in his general stock of knowledge, taken for granted by him and at hand for his projects into the future. Habitualization carries with it the important psychological gain that choices are narrowed. While in theory there may be a hundred ways to go about a project of building a canoe out of matchsticks, habitualization narrows those down to one. This frees the individual from the burden of all those decisions, providing a psychological relief that has its basis in man's undirected instinctual structure. Habitualization provides the direction and the specialization of activity that is lacking in man's biological equipment thus relieving the accumulation of tensions that result from undirected drives. So we're going to skip 
to this paragraph in terms of the meanings bestowed by man upon his activity. Habitualization makes it unnecessary for each situation to be defined anew, step by step. A large variety of situations may be subsumed under its brief definitions. The activity to be undertaken in these situations can then be anticipated. And then the next um, excerpt under institutionalization. Only at this point does it become possible to speak of a social world at all, in the sense of a comprehensive and given reality confronting the individual in a manner analogous to the reality of the natural world. Only in this way, as an objective world, can the social formations be transmitted to a new generation. In the early phases of socialization, the child is quite incapable of distinguishing between the objectivity of natural phenomena and the objectivity of social formations. To take the most important item of socialization, language appears to the child as inherent in the nature of things, and he cannot grasp the notion of its conventionality. A thing is what it is called and it could not be called anything else. All institutions appear in the same way as given, unalterable, and self-evident. Even our empirically unlikely example of parents having constructed an institutional world, de novo, meaning out of nothing, the objectivity of this world be, be increased for them by the socialization of their children because the objectivity experienced by the children would reflect back upon their own experience of this world. Empirically, of course, the institutional world transmitted by most parents already has the character of historical and objective reality. The process of transmission simply strengthens the parent's sense of reality, if only because, to put it crudely, if one says, this is how things are done. Often enough, one believes it oneself. So now we'll move on to W.I. Thomas and the Thomas Theorem, which is, if men define their situations as real, they are real in their consequences. In other words, the way people are led to subjectively interpret an event is what constitutes reality, not necessarily what really objectively happened. So basically, what we believe is true, even if it's not true. Perception is reality, as long as enough people agree to it. So Thompson claims that our moral codes, our social norms, they're created by successive definitions of the situation. So we can compare this to probably a game you played when you were pretty small, that game of telephone, when a bunch of kids sit in a circle, um, one kid comes up with something that they're going to whisper into the, um, the kid next to them's ear, and then so on and so forth. The message is continuously relayed around the circle until the last person. Um, then the last person will say out loud what they heard. And usually it's very different from what the first person said in the first place. And um, in quick succession, children are interpreting the sentence differently. So this is just an illustration of what theorem, uh, the Thomas theorem is communicating. That basically, whatever we hear, whatever we interpret, that's what's real. Then there's a, an excerpt up here. It's a little blurry, so I'll read it to you um, from Thomas's book, The Methodology of Behavior Study. So he says, with the progress of our studies of the various behavior forming situations, we may hope to approach the still more obscure problem of mass behavior, the problem of whole populations and common sentiments and actions. This is represented by fashions of dress, mob action, war hysteria, the gang spirit, mafia, 
the merit, the fascism, popularity of this or that cigarette or toothpaste, the quick fame and quick infamy of political personalities, etc. We are unable to define this total situation satisfactorily, but it involves the interaction of language and gesture and gossip and print and symbols and slogans and propaganda and imitation, and seems more than anything else the process eventuating in the formation of the distinctive character of communities, nationalities, and races. The process itself may be described as a series of definitions of situations whereby behavior norms are established. Now another symbolic interactionist we're going to look at is Robert K. Merton and his concept of the self-fulfilling prophecy, which means that even a false idea can become true if it's acted upon. A prediction that directly or indirectly causes itself to become true. These can be self-created or imposed by others. So, for instance, when a kid is maybe in kindergarten, um, and maybe they're maybe they test the boundaries. They don't always follow the rules, um, and maybe they have a teacher who just doesn't have patience for that particular child. They might label that child as deviant or a bad kid. Um, from a young age, and that teacher might call the parents in for a parent-teacher conference and express their concern about the child's deviance um, or miss bad behavior. Um, but a result of this is that even though that child may not have turned out to be a deviant adult, being labeled a deviant at such a young age can actually end up in that person becoming deviant as a result because they feel inclined to act in the way that people around them seem to expect them to act. So this is the self-fulfilling prophecy, something that wouldn't have otherwise been true um, if kind of that false idea hadn't been uh, promulgated or promoted in the first place. So uh, there's a little excerpt over here as well from Merton's um, writings. So we can start, we'll start at the top. The parable tells us that public definitions of a situation, prophecies or predictions become an integral part of the situation and thus affect subsequent developments. This is peculiar to human affairs. It's not found in the world of nature. Predictions of the return of Halley's Comet do not influence its orbit, but the rumored insolvency of Millingville Bank did affect the actual outcome. The prophecy of collapse led to its own fulfillment. So common is the pattern of the self-fulfilling prophecy that each of us has his favorite specimen. Consider the case of the examination neurosis. Convinced that he is destined to fail, the anxious student devotes more time to worry than to study and then turns in a poor exam. The initially fallacious anxiety is transformed into an entirely justified fear. Or it is believed that war between two nations is inevitable. Actuated by this conviction, representatives of the two nations become progressively alienated apprehensively countering each offensive move of the other with a defensive move of their own. Stockpiles of armaments, raw materials, and armed men grow larger, and eventually the anticipation of war helps create the actuality. The self-fulfilling prophecy is, in the beginning, a false definition of the situation, evoking a new behavior which makes the originally false conception come true. The specious validity of the self-fulfilling prophecy perpetuates a reign of error. And then on this slide, we have a couple more excerpts from Martin's self-fulfilling prophecy. 
So we'll start over here on the left with the first one. The application of the Thomas theorem also suggests how the tragic, often vicious cycle of self-fulfilling prophecies can be broken. The initial definition of the situation which has set the circle in motion must be abandoned. Only when the original assumption is questioned and a new definition of the situation introduced does the consequent flow of events give lie to the assumption. Only then does the belief no longer father the reality. But to question these deep-rooted definitions of the situation is no simple act of will. The will, the will, or for that matter, goodwill, cannot be turned on and off like a faucet. Social intelligence and goodwill are themselves products of distinct social forces. They are not brought into this being by mass propaganda and mass education in the usual sense of these terms, so dear to the sociological panaceans. In the social realm, no more than in the psychological realm, do false ideas quietly vanish when confronted with the truth. One does not expect a paranoiac to abandon his hard-won distortions and delusions upon being informed that they are altogether groundless. If psychic ills could be cured merely by the dissemination of truth, the psychiatrists of this country would be suffering from technological unemployment rather than overwork. Nor will a continuing educational campaign itself destroy racial prejudice and discrimination. And then we can look over here on the right to the second excerpt. Start up top with these changes and others of the same kind do not occur automatically. The self-fulfilling prophecy whereby fears are translated into reality operates only in the absence of deliberate institutional controls. And it is only with the rejection of social fatalism implied in the notion of unchangeable human nature that the tragic circle of fear, social disaster, reinforced fear can be broken. Ethnic prejudices do die, but slowly. They can be helped over the threshold of oblivion, not by insisting that it is unreasonable and unworthy of them to survive, but by cutting off their sustenance now provided by certain conditions of our society. If we find ourselves doubting man's capacity con to control man and his society, if we persist in our tendency to find in the patterns of the past the chart of the future, it is perhaps time to take up anew the wisdom of Tocqueville's 112-year-old apothem. What we call necessary institutions are, no often, are often no more than institutions to which we have grown accustomed. Nor can widespread, even typical failures in planning human relations between ethnic groups be cited as evidence for pessimism. In the world laboratory of the sociologist, as in the more secluded laboratories of the physicist and chemist, it is the successful experiment which is decisive and not the thousand and one failures which preceded it. More is learned from a single success than from multiple failures. A single success proves it can be done. Therefore, it's necessary only to learn what made it work. This, at last, at least, is what I take to be the sociological sense of those revealing words. Whatever is, is possible. And the last example for symbolic interactionism is Irving Goffman and his concept of dramaturgy or role performance. So Goffman believed that a person, each person, is like an actor on a stage. Each situation is a new scene and individuals play different roles depending on who is present for the performance and what role they're playing at the time. So for instance, I'm sure each of you has a lot of different roles that you play day to day. You might play an employee. You might play mother or father, um, daughter or son, you might be a sister, um, you might go to the grocery store and be a shopper. Um, 
You might go to the bank and be a client. You might go to church and be a believer. So there are a lot of different roles that we um, embody depending on where we are um, and who's around us. So for instance, who you are around your friends from uh, high school or old friends that you have, it's probably a little bit of a different uh, role than who you are around your grandma uh, or your boss. You show different sides of you depending on who you're talking to um, and the relationship that you have with that person. So that's what uh, Goffman's Dramaturgy is trying to say. So again, I have a couple excerpts from Goffman on here. We'll start with this top one. The implication here is that an honest, sincere, serious performance is less firmly connected with the solid world than one might first assume. And this implication will be strengthened if we look again at the distance usually placed between quite honest performances and quite contrived ones. In this connection, take, for example, the remarkable phenomenon of stage acting. It does take deep skill, long training, and psychological capacity to become a good stage actor. But this fact should not blind us to another one, that almost anyone can quickly learn a script well enough to give charitable audience some sense of realness in what is being contrived before them. And it seems this is so because ordinary social intercourse is itself put together as a scene is put together by the exchange of dramatically inflated actions, counteractions, and terminating replies. Scripts, even in the hands of unpracticed players, can come to life because life itself is a dramatically enacted thing. All the world is not, of course, a stage, but the crucial ways in which it isn't are not easy to specify. And then um, the second excerpt down here, start at it. It is commonplace to say that different social groupings express in different ways such attributes as age, sex, territory, and class status, and that in each case these bare attributes are elaborated by means of a distinctive complex cultural configuration of proper ways of conducting oneself. To be a given kind of person, then, is not merely to possess the required attributes, but also to sustain the standards of conduct and appearance that one's social grouping attaches thereto. The unthinking ease with which performers consistently carry off such standard maintaining routines does not deny that a performance has occurred, merely that the participants have been made aware of it. A status, a position, a social place is not a material thing to be possessed and then displayed. It is a pattern of appropriate conduct, coherent, embellished, and well articulated, performed with ease or clumsiness, awareness or not, guile or good faith. It is nonetheless something that must be enacted and portrayed, something that must be realized. So that's it for Goffman and symbolic interactionism. Um, but we're going to go a little bit further into roles and status here, since Goffman kind of paved the way for that. So roles and status. Roles are patterns of behavior that we recognize in each other and are representative of a person's social status. So again, think of all those different roles you play in your day-to-day -day life. You're a student, a son or a daughter, sister or brother, friend, employee a parent, musician, an athlete, a coworker, a boss, a grandchild, a spouse. Each of those different roles is associated with a different status. Status being the responsibilities and benefits that a person experiences according to their rank and role in society. So we talk about status and all your different roles. The status of a mother is higher than the status of a daughter or um, a status of a boss is higher than the status of an employee, so on and so forth. 
Um, so moving a little further to look at roles and um, different rankings of status, we're going to look at a social experiment that was performed in the 1970s. So the Stanford Prison Experiment is a really famous experiment conducted back in 1971 by Philip Zimbardo. He is what we call a social psychologist. So he kind of uh, is a little bit of a psychologist and a little bit of a sociologist. So his social experiment demonstrated how people can adapt to roles and even hurt other people because of the role they are playing. And his experiment illustrates role expectations and stereotyped role conflict. So what Zimbardo did in 1971 at Stanford he went around, got um, a lot of male students to volunteer to be part of his social experiment. And Stanford allowed him and funded him um, to build a makeshift prison, quote unquote, um, kind of in the basement of one of the buildings there on, on campus. So they built cells and um, had little, you know, little toilets that you might expect to see in a jail, everything um, that you would expect to see in a jail. They got uniforms, um, they had, you know, sticks for the, the guards, and what Zimbardo did was he randomly um, kind of put all the volunteers from the group and assign them a role of either prisoner or guard. And again, these are all students at Stanford. They're all pretty well off, educated. Um, if they were in a classroom, they would view themselves probably as pretty equal. Um, but once Zimbardo kind of put them into this social experiment and assigned them these specific roles of prisoners or guards, um, these people started to kind of act out these roles based on kind of what they'd seen in the past, books they'd read, movies, what they'd seen in the news, what they'd heard about prisons or um, guards, and how these kinds of people should act. So I really hope you all will take the time to watch this video here. Um, it's Philip Zimbardo kind of looking back on his experiment from 1971 and analyzing it. There's quite a bit of original footage from the experiment on there, which is pretty jolting. Um, you can see how far some of these students took their role of being a guard and um, almost performed some uh, close to Guantanamo uh, kind of psychological terror on the students that were assigned the role of prisoner. Um, so it just shows kind of how far people can really take that um, concept of the role and status and take advantage of it. Um, or not. There were others who did not want to play along and did not uh, abide by the role and the status as well. So I hope you watch that video. It's not too long and it uh, sheds a lot of light on um, the human experience and status positions within society. And once you've finished um, watching that, just think to yourself, um, these of questions. Why do you think the prisoners and guards behaved the way they did in the Zimbardo simulated prison experiment? Suppose all the people who were randomly assigned to be guards had instead been assigned to be prisoners and vice versa. How do you think that would have affected the behavior of the people? Do you think they would have behaved differently?